Hi everybody, here I am again working my way through Lee Strobel's The Case for Christ, one chapter at a time, and I'm about to go through chapter 7, The Identity Evidence. Was Jesus really convinced he was the Son of God? Strobel opens this chapter by telling us about John Douglas, and this time it's not so much of an opening chapter anecdote as he's used in the previous chapters, as it is just a summary of who John Douglas was and his work. John Douglas was a criminal profiler for the FBI. He was actually the basis for the character of Jack Crawford in The Silence of the Lambs. And using details gathered from crime scene evidence and interviews with witnesses and interviews with surviving victims, Douglas was able to assemble psychological profiles of killers that had not been apprehended. And these psychological profiles were so accurate that it actually enabled Douglas to make very precise predictions about the type of people these killers they were hunting would turn out to be. And Strobel cites the example of the trailside killer in San Francisco in the late 1970s, who Douglas correctly predicted would be a man with a speech impediment and tendencies toward animal cruelty, arson, and bedwetting. Having introduced the concept of profiling, Strobel explains how that could be applied to understanding Jesus. He says that we can create a profile of Jesus using methods similar to those employed by John Douglas. Because to Lee Strobel, the question of what Jesus thought about himself is of uh, critical importance. He says it's a critical issue. Since there are some that argue that the belief in the deity of Jesus was a later addition to the Christian tradition, that, that Jesus himself and his earliest followers didn't think of him as a god, that the church added that later on. So we come to the sixth interview in the book, and this time the subject is Ben Witherington III. And if this were an episode of Mystery Science Theater 3000, this is the point where a crow would say, Oh, is Ben Witherington III going to be interviewed? Ben Witherington III is the author of books like Jesus the Sage and The Many Faces of the Christ. He has a Master of Divinity degree from Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary, a Doctorate of Theology from the University of Durham. He's a member of the Society for the Study of the New Testament, the Society for Biblical Literature, and the Institute for Biblical Research. He's also, at least at the time that The Case for Christ was written, something of an aspiring filmmaker. Strobel describes how Witherington takes him on a tour of his studio where he is mixing images of Jesus with music to, quote, illuminate the compassion, the sacrifice, the humanity, and the majesty of Jesus' life and ministry. And by the way, those are Strobel's words. With tough, objective, journalistic chops like that, Lee Strobel could write for the Herald Mail. Now, Strobel asks Witherington whether it's true that in the Bible Jesus is evasive about his true identity, whether or not he shies away from proclaiming himself to be God outright, and if this is because he didn't think of himself as God. Witherington's take on it is that Jesus was careful about how he described himself publicly because he didn't want to confuse or offend the Jews of his day who would not have understood the concept of the Trinity of which Jesus was a part, and they would have viewed Jesus' claim to be God as blasphemy because Jews believed in a God that was non-human. Witherington says, quote, Besides, there were already a host of expectations about what the Messiah would look like, and Jesus didn't want to be pigeonholed into somebody else's categories. Now, Witherington doesn't elaborate, so it would be nice to know on what he bases this insight into Jesus' motives. And I've noticed Christians do this a lot. Many Christians are totally comfortable telling us what Jesus thought, what Jesus wanted, why Jesus didn't do this, what Jesus' expectations were, what Jesus' motives were, and, uh, and also God himself. We know that God didn't do that because he didn't want this to happen, blah, blah, blah. And they never cite any scripture. They never explain where this insight into the mind of God comes from. For people who are supposed to be so worshipful and fearful of this mighty God, they sure have no problem whatsoever speaking for him. I've always found that interesting. Exploring the earliest traditions is the next section. Strobel mentions, quote, a 1977 book by British theologian John Hick and half a dozen like-minded colleagues, unquote, that popularized the idea that the historical Jesus never actually thought of himself as a god, that the concepts of the Incarnation 
and Jesus as the Messiah were added to the Christian tradition later, after the life of Jesus. And here Strobel continues his bad habit that we saw in the previous chapter of referencing things that he never explains or never elaborates on. The book, the 1977 book by John Hick that he mentions, that is the jumping off point for this portion of the conversation, is called The Myth of God Incarnate. Strobel never tells you what the title of the book is in the chapter, but it's called The Myth of God Incarnate. It was published in 1977, edited by John Hick, uh, who just died on February 9, incidentally, with contributions by Hick himself and Maurice Wiles, Francis Young, Michael Goulder, Leslie Holden, Don Cuppet, and Dennis Nynam. That's the book. To determine how Jesus actually saw himself, Witherington turned to, quote, the very earliest traditions about Jesus, the most primitive material, unquestionably safe from legendary development. There it goes again with this, this material was too early to have been made up argument, which is, I think, horseshit. What sort of clues did Witherington find to the self-identity of Jesus as he explored these supposedly safe early traditions? Well, for instance, Jesus had 12 disciples, but Jesus was not one of the 12 himself suggesting to Witherington that he is not merely a part of the group he is trying to redeem, but the one who is forming the group, just as God formed the twelve tribes of Israel in the Old Testament, Jesus putting himself in the role of God. Witherington also notes that Jesus describes John the Baptist as the greatest man on earth, and then goes on to exceed the work of John in his own ministry, suggesting that Jesus considered himself to be greater than the greatest man. Jesus redefines what it means to be defiled or to be made unclean, placing more importance on the actions of people than on what is done to people. In other words, what you do to others is what defiles you in the teachings of Jesus, not what touches you or what enters your body, as was the, the, the old Jewish tradition. And this contradicts laws about purity that are in Leviticus. Jesus' relationship with the Jewish religious leaders suggests that he considered his own authority to be above their authority. And the fact that the Roman authorities considered Jesus to be dangerous enough to warrant executing him suggests to Witherington that he was more than just a simple teacher, a wandering sage. He was a more dangerous threat to Roman authority. By the finger of God, next section, Witherington argues that the miracles of Jesus testify to his view of himself as God, not just the miracles themselves, since the disciples were also able to perform miracles elsewhere in the sober, incredible New Testament, but the fact that Jesus performed his miracles on his own authority. Witherington says, quote, Jesus sees his miracles as bringing about something unprecedented, the coming of God's dominion. He doesn't merely see himself as a worker of miracles. He sees himself as the one in whom and through whom the promises of God come to pass. But then Strobel helpfully protests that, you know, they called Jesus rabbi. He was called rabbi by his followers. Doesn't that imply that he was just another teacher like the rabbis of his time? Well, Witherington says, no, actually Jesus taught in a way that was very, very different from the other rabbis of his day. He presented his teachings and affirmed the truth of his teachings on his own authority without appealing to the testimony of two witnesses, which was part of Jewish tradition. And Jesus also referred to God using the Aramaic word Abba, which is a term that a child would use to refer to their father. It's a very intimate, very personal term. So if Jesus would call God by Abba, that would mean that he was positioning himself in a very close, intimate relationship with God. And he also encouraged his disciples to pray to God using the same word. And that suggests that he saw himself as this creator, this initiator of an entirely new sort of relationship between humans and God. And that by coming to him first and then having him tell you to pray to God, through the term Abba, that he was facilitating your connection with God in a way that hadn't been done before. Strobel says, quote, There seemed little question, based on the earliest evidence, that Jesus considered himself to be more than a doer of great deeds, more than a teacher, more than another prophet in the line of many. There was ample evidence to conclude that he thought of himself in unique 
in supreme terms. I note that neither Strobel nor Witherington ever defines what this earliest evidence on which they're basing these conclusions about the identity of Jesus is or how it differs from the Gospels as we have them today, which would have been nice to know. John's portrait of Jesus. Strobel quotes the opening passage of the Gospel of John and wonders whether Jesus would have found this to be a fair representation of him. And here's the opening of the Gospel of John as Strobel quotes it in The Case for Christ. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father full of grace and truth. And that is the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, and then also verse 14, tacked on there at the end. That is how Strobel quotes it in this chapter. Witherington believes that that portrayal of Jesus, as we just heard from the opening of John, would be accurate to how the historical Jesus saw himself. And Witherington also argues that even without the Gospel of John, which has the most obvious declarations of the deity of Jesus, the Gospels still make it clear that Jesus was the Messiah and that he was the Son of God. There was a, a unique, divine quality about him. Strobel then asks about popular depictions of Jesus and how they portray him as a more conflicted figure, someone who's not as certain about his identity or his mission. And he specifically references the film The Last Temptation of Christ, which to me is the second best film ever made about Jesus after Pier Paolo Pasolini's the Gospel according to St. Matthew. Witherington argues that depictions like this get it wrong, that the Jesus of the Gospels isn't confused or conflicted about who he is or what he's supposed to do, although he does have what Witherington calls uh, crisis moments where his identity is confirmed by God. And for Witherington, these moments would be the baptism, the temptation in the desert, the transfiguration, and the agony in the Garden of Gethsemane. And by the way, why do I say that The Last Temptation of Christ and Pasolini's Gospel according to St. Matthew are the best films about Jesus because they are works of art on the subject of Jesus. They're films about Jesus and they're not advertisements for Christianity, which unfortunately is what most films about Jesus turn out to be. Witherington claims that Jesus saw the redemption of the people of Israel as his mission and that he had no doubts about that and that he left the outreach to those outside the Jewish community, to the Gentiles, uh, to the later church. That was not his mission. His mission was saving Israel. Next section, I and the Father are one. Strobel cites William Lane Craig. Not doing yourself any favors with me there, Lee. And also Jaroslav Pelikan to argue that the sermons and the prayers that we have surviving from the early church all testify that those people believe that Jesus was God, that the Jesus, the divinity of Jesus is a very, very early church doctrine. Witherington argues that this would not have happened if Jesus himself had not taught these things, had not made it clear that that was who he was. Witherington says, quote, Is it probable that all this stuff was conjured up out of thin air within 20 years after Jesus died, when there were still living witnesses to what Jesus the historical figure was really like? I find that just about as unlikely a historical hypothesis as you could possibly come up with. Then you need to go back to school. If you find divinely conceived demigod worked miracles and rose from the dead to be a more credible historical hypothesis than superstitious people made stuff up, then you can't expect me to take you seriously. And then Witherington launches into a page-long monologue about who Jesus thought himself to be, ending with, quote, We have to ask, why is there no other first-century Jew who has millions of followers today? Why, of all first-century figures, including the Roman emperors, is Jesus still worshipped today while the others have crumbled into the dust of history? It's because this Jesus, the historical Jesus, is also the living Lord, that or the Edict of Milan. 
And then the last section of this chapter, in the very place of God. Again, citing William Lane Craig, Strobel reiterates the argument that Jesus, the historical Jesus, did think of himself as the Son of God, as the one and only bringer of salvation, as pretty much all the things that Christians believe he was. And Strobel mentions Craig's observation that Jesus' claims about who he was were so extraordinary that one can't help but ask, as British theologian James Dunn once did, was Jesus mad? I sense a false dilemma coming on, but that will have to wait until the next chapter because that's the end of chapter 7. You know, this entire chapter felt sort of unnecessary to me personally because I'm perfectly fine with the idea that Jesus thought of himself as the Son of God. I, I don't know whether he actually did or not since we know almost nothing about the historical Jesus, but I don't think who Jesus thought himself to be proves anything about who he was. So to me, this feels like Strobel and Witherington have just sort of been pushing against an open door for this chapter. My beliefs about Christianity aren't affected one way or the other by how Jesus saw himself. But on the other hand, I actually enjoyed some of the examination of the character of Jesus in this chapter. It's the sort of uh, literary analysis of the Bible that I wish I saw more of. It's too bad that Witherington's goal in doing it was to defend the Word of God from more skeptical interpretations rather than to actually try to understand the character of Jesus, but it does appeal nonetheless to the English major in me. And incidentally, that desire to deconstruct and understand Jesus is something that the films I mentioned a few minutes ago, The Last Temptation of Christ and The Gospel According to St. Matthew, have in common. And if you haven't seen those and you want to see what I think is the best cinematic art ever produced on the subject of Jesus, uh, check those out, The Last Temptation of Christ and Pasolini's uh, Gospel According to St. Matthew. Uh, Cecil B. DeMille's original silent version of King of Kings is a good one to check out, too. It's a little bit too reverent for my taste, so I don't quite rank it on the same level as Matthew or Last Temptation. But it's a great, very influential, very technically accomplished film with two sequences in two-strip Technicolor, which is relatively rare for a a surviving silent film. So, And all of the films, all three of those, are available on DVD, and actually Last Temptation and King of Kings uh, have additions as part of the Criterion Collection. So if you're interested, if you haven't seen those, check those out. Those are really great Jesus movies. Next time, we'll be covering Chapter 8, The Psychological Evidence. Was Jesus crazy when he claimed to be the Son of God? That should be interesting. As always, thank you guys so much for watching and for commenting, participating. I really appreciate it. It's really nice that so many of you are following along and are, are interested in this and taking something from it and making some use of it. I think that's awesome, and I will see you next time.